We come to the end of the book of Colossians today for our study there. You, you can keep going there as many times as you want to. That's not off limits, but our sermon series comes to a close today. And I'm reminded of, as we come to these verses, and you'll see why here in a, in a second, I'm reminded of those Beatles lyrics, uh, oh, I get by with a little help from my friends. Now, the very next lyric says, I get high with a little help from my friends. So I'm not thinking of that line specifically. I'm thinking of, I get by with a little help from my friends. For me, that's the story of Mercy Village Church. Except, and I'm not a better poet than John Lennon or Paul McCartney, but I would tweak the lyrics to say I get by with a lot of help from my friends. That's been my experience as Jesus has built out Mercy Village Church. And the Apostle Paul would share that story over even more church plants than I've been a part of. He was part of many. As he writes to the saints at Colossae, he says, hey, I get by with a lot of help from my friends, and here's who they are. This is a list of names that we're going to look at today, but there is so much to glean from it for us as we close out this, this book. There's an even bigger message, though, to what is being said today. And it matters that we understand this. The first sentence is what we've seen in the entire book of Colossians. The only true celebrity in church history is the triune God. Yeah, that's, if Colossians has told us anything, it is that there's only one true celebrity, only one true hero in the story, and it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Now this matters as we think about the church, because it's easy in our day and age, especially in first world countries, in the world of megachurches, in the world of celebrity pastors, in the world of Christian influencers to lose sight, to start to think that there's some gap between where I'm standing and where you're sitting, that there's an even larger gap between where I'm standing and where the Apostle Paul was standing, that there's somehow this hierarchy of, of belonging, this hierarchy of importance in the church, and that's just not true. There is a hierarchy of importance. Jesus God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, supreme over all. That's the hierarchy. And then there's, there's us. That's why the second part of the sentence matters. The rest of the story of the church is one of countless diverse people transformed and equipped by Jesus for all the seen and unseen work of the kingdom. And we see this in this list of names that Paul gives to us. But I first want to remind us of the, of the nature of the book. The reason I had Coach DeRose read for us from the first chapter was to reset our uh, review the main idea of Colossians. We'll read it again because it's worth being read again. We see that Jesus is, right, that the triune God is the true hero of the church, and in particular in the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul has emphasized the role of God the Son, Jesus, as the hero of this letter. He is the image, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, through Jesus and for Jesus. And, he, and Jesus is before all things. And in Jesus, all things hold together. And he Jesus is the head of the, the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything Jesus might be preeminent. For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His, by making peace by the blood of Jesus' cross. This is the message of, the primary message the, the, the major takeaway of the letter to the saints at Colossae. When, when he talks to them in chapter 1 and is celebrating with thankfulness the ongoing transformation that he sees in their lives, who does he put at the center of their transformation? This is, a, this, this, this is an easy answer question. Who does he put at the center of their transformation? Jesus. 
when He calls them to ongoing and further transformation in chapter 3, this is class participation, who is at the center of that call? Jesus. When we get to the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3, Paul shares a little bit of his story, how he's toiling in ministry, toiling in church planting, suffering in prison for the sake of the church. Who does he put at the center of the story? Jesus. You're, you guys are doing pretty good. We don't normally do this, so this is, I get it, it's our first time. I just want to tell you, like, I'm probably going to ask two more times, the answer both times is Jesus, okay? So just, just be ready for that. When he talks about the reconciliation of the saints, he spends time talking about that in chapter 2 and how that transforms our relationship to God and our relationship to one another. Who does he put at the center of that? Jesus. The central uh, person in reshaping our relationships with one another and our relationships with those outside of Christ is who? Jesus. And we could go on with every detail of this letter to the saints at Colossae, and at the center of it all is, is Jesus. I, I say all of that because, yes, it takes a village. In fact, that's the title of the sermon. Felt that, that felt cheesy and good and right. It just felt like the right thing to say because we're in the village of Barbersville, and it's about a community of people working together for the sake of the kingdom, and sometimes you've got to be cheesy. So it does take a village. But who makes the village? Jesus. Right? That's the point of the whole letter. Yes, we're going to see a list of names, a beautiful list of names. But it is Jesus who has compiled this team. It is Jesus who has compiled this group of apostles and teachers and prophets and people opening up their homes with hospitality and on and on and on. It's Jesus who's made the village. Don't forget that. Jesus has chosen to build His church in such a way that it requires people, you and me, to take up, our, take up His yoke and walk with Him in ministry. He starts with a man named Tychicus. We're just going to go through these names. He starts with a man named Tychicus, and Tychicus reminds us of this, and I'll explain what I mean Tychicus reminds us that the kingdom advances in carrying water for others. I'll get to what I mean by that. Tychicus will tell you, this is verse 7, all about my activities. He is a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and he may encourage your hearts. Tychicus, in this verse... His entire mission revolves around two sets of people. One is Paul and those other ones who are there in prison in Rome. And the other are the people in Colossae, the saints in Colossae. You know who it doesn't revolve around? Tychicus. That expression, carry someone else's water, is, is the idea that you will be doing the work that brings benefit, that brings credit to someone else. That advances the mission, the goals, and the desires of someone else. The kingdom of God is filled with that. People carrying other people's water. This is Tychicus' M.O. We see him in Acts. We see him in Ephesians. We see him in Colossians, obviously, Titus, and in 2 Timothy. And what he's known primarily for is carrying the words of Paul to other people. He's carrying other people's water. Let me ask you, who's more important? The person who writes, and I mean the human. Obviously, God authored Scripture. So, I don't need your Sunday school answer to this. He authored Scripture through Paul. But who was more important in the process? Paul, who wrote it with his hand, or Tychicus, who delivered it with his hand. Who's more important in the process? If you're even trying to answer the question, I know I set you up for this. But if you're even trying to answer the question, you're missing the point. You know what the Apostle Paul realizes? The Apostle Paul realized that he is nothing more than Tychicus to the triune God. Paul doesn't have anything original to bring. He doesn't have an original message. He has a message from God. 
He is Tychicus to the triune God, the carrier of the message. So he can honor Tychicus as much as he would ever honor himself, more so than he would honor himself, because it's not a competition in the kingdom. And Tychicus can carry water for Paul and realize that that's just as valuable as anything else. That's where we find Tychicus. We also see that he's a beloved brother. He's relational. He's a faithful minister. He's he's trusted. He has integrity. These are things we can learn from. But most of all, he's a fellow water carrier. He's a fellow servant. Paul says, yeah, it's this point. We're all servants in the kingdom. And most importantly, he's in Christ. That makes everything different. He brings the letter. He brings the report to the to the saints at Colossae. That's who Tychicus is. I mean, hundreds of miles on foot and on boat, by the way. I mean, like, not an easy job. Not a, not a safe job either in this day and age. But there's somebody with him, and, and his name's Onesimus. And Onesimus reminds us not only that the kingdom advances through carrying the water of others, which he is part of that too, but he also reminds us that there's space in the kingdom for anyone. Verse 9 says, And with him, with Tychicus, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will tell you everything that has taken place here. Now this verse doesn't feel like a big one by itself. I don't know what order they've read these letters in, but there were two letters that Tychicus and Onesimus held in their hands. One was Colossians. The other was Philemon. And Philemon was written for the whole church to read, but it was written directly to a man who hosted the church of Colossae in his home. And Philemon had a slave. And that slave had stolen from him and ran away, never to see Philemon again. It's if God wrote a different story. That slave met Paul in Rome. God saved him. Transformed his life. And his name was Onesimus. He was on the fringes of society as a slave. And he put himself even further on the fringes of society by becoming a thief, adding thief to his resume, and adding runaway to his resume. Again, we've talked about this. This this was not slavery like we understand it in North America. He had a debt that he was paying off, that he owed either a criminal debt or a financial debt. He was obligated to fulfill this thing and he had not done it. But the kingdom of God is made up with people from the fringes. You ever met the 12 disciples? They were on the fringes. You ever met the Apostle Paul? He had power and authority, but he used his power and authority to kill Christians. God saved him. There's room for anyone and everyone in the kingdom of God. Who's more important, the socially elite, the socially acceptable, or the socially overlooked and and outcasted? Again, you know now, if you're trying to answer the question, you're missing the point. Paul knows that the only pedigree that matters is the relationship that we have with Jesus. And so Onesimus, the former slave runaway thief, shares with Tychicus, who is far more famous and trusted maybe by society, as a member of society, he has integrity and is seen as they are both trusted with the same job to carry Colossians and Philemon to this river valley town hundreds of miles away from Rome to deliver it to the saints. So we see that in them. He has the same job of Tychicus to bring the letter and a report. He's also considered faithful by Paul. The runaway, the thief, the man who was deeply in debt is called faithful by the Apostle Paul. You tell me that ain't Jesus, right? Like you could look at Tychicus and be like, well, maybe it wasn't Jesus. You'd be wrong, right? But we tend to do that. We look at the people who aren't on the fringes and 
right? It's, it's not quite as obvious to us. That there's been transformation, but for Onesimus, it was. And, and he calls him faithful. He calls him a beloved brother. More importantly, he reminds us in the book of Philemon that he too, Onesimus, is in Christ. And together, they are water carriers for someone else. They carry water for someone else. Let go of your need for self-accomplishment and affirmation. Timothy Keller, I've mentioned him twice and maybe a little bit redundant. A great pastor out of New York City and church planter. And maybe you are or are not aware of, of his ministry. But he released these videos to his congregation to the congregations of Redeemer, even though he's no longer the lead pastor, to the leaders of Redeemer, right before he died. This is the video, in the video that went out the week before he died, he, he drew everyone's attention to Jeremiah 45.5. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. He talked about it in the context of New York City, how people can come into gospel ministry in a place like New York City, treat it as an avenue to fame, an avenue to wealth, an avenue to being known, being seen. I'm a New York City pastor, or I'm a New York City, you know, someone influential in the church in New York City, and You seek great things for yourself, he said. Seek them not. Same is true in Barbersville, West Virginia and points surrounding. We as the children of God are called to something so countercultural, so weird, so strange. Our own hearts don't even believe it's true half the time. Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them. Carry water for the kingdom. There's nowhere you'll be happier. There's nowhere you'll find deeper fulfillment or deeper joy. And that seems like so anti, uh, it seems so antithetical to, to what we are trained to believe in society. You got to go get yours. You got to grind for it. You got to go get it. You got to get your own stuff. Nobody's coming for you. Seek great things for yourself. Seek them not. Or, do you seek great things for yourself? Jesus says, you're doing it wrong unless you lay your stuff down and carry water for the kingdom. By the way, that water you're carrying for the kingdom is yours. That water you're carrying for the kingdom will quench your thirst like no other water ever could. That water you're carrying for the kingdom is the reviving essence of your existence and your future, your past, your present, your future, because it's Jesus. I'm harping now, I'm sorry. Aristarchus is the next name. He reminds us that apprenticing with Jesus is is worth any cost. He's the first part of verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Now, we don't learn much about him in that sentence, but we know a little bit about him from other parts of the gospel, that he's a travel companion to the Apostle Paul. We see him in Acts chapter 20 and in Acts chapter 27. We also see him in Acts chapter 19 in this weird scene where the crowd turns against Paul and some of the fellows who are with him, and they're going to kill him, and the guards kind of drag him to safety. Aristarchus is in that bunch. So we don't know much about Aristarchus, except his legacy is this. He said, thy kingdom come, living a life that says thy kingdom come is worth more to me than freedom. He's in prison now. Living a life that says thy kingdom come is worth more to me than my life itself. He risked his life beside the Apostle Paul. What a great legacy that would be of us. If what was said, right, like they didn't write anything else about us in the history books, even if it's just the history of our families, right? Like if your great-great-grandkids 
who barely even know your name, said, knew nothing else about you except for this. That man, that woman valued an apprenticeship with Jesus. He valued living a thy kingdom lifestyle, thy kingdom come lifestyle. She loved following Jesus so much that she would have given anything. He would have given anything to follow Jesus. They don't know how much money you made. They don't know what your uh, uh, GPA was. They don't know what sports you played. But they know that. That's Aristarchus. We know nothing else about him but that. It's a pretty good legacy. Next, we see John, Mark, and Demas. They're number four and five. They're in two separate verses. But we see that kingdom work is accomplished by failing ones. Good news. Uh, verse 9, uh, this, or the second half of verse 9 says, no, sorry, verse 10. Uh, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning him you have received instructions. If he comes, you welcome him. And then fast forward down to verse 14. You see another name there. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. We'll come back to him, as does Demas. Two men, we know little of all you've read about them is Colossians. You know very little of their story, so I'll tell you about it real quick. The Apostle Paul, on his very first missionary journey, goes with a man named Barnabas, son of encouragement, and a few other people, and one of them is John Mark. They get about halfway through the missionary journey, and John Mark bails. He leaves. Pulls the plug. In a time of need, right, this is, a, this is an all-hands-on-deck type of moment as they make this mission trip together, he bails, he cuts, and runs. Demas kind of has an opposite story. John Mark fails very early in his ministry. Demas is still ministering well beside Paul in this moment. He's sitting with him in prison, but if you read the later letters from Paul, you hear a different story about Demas. Then in a crucial time, Demas, loving the things of the world, abandons Paul. Two men turn their back on the gospel, turn their back on the church, turn their back on Paul and walk off. They're not the only ones that struggle with sin during that uh, season, especially the one with Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. The Bible tells us that Paul and Barnabas have a sharp disagreement because Barnabas says, of the second missionary journey, he says, I want to take John Mark with us. Let's give him a second chance. And Paul says, nope, absolutely not. And the Bible says that Barnabas and John Mark have a sharp disagreement in that moment. And I know we like to make these guys heroes and, and we like to think, well, the Apostle Paul wrote the most books of the Bible, so he must have been the most righteous in this moment. But I don't know. I find it really hard to believe that in the midst of this passionate disagreement, there wasn't sin in their hearts. They weren't failing in some ways as they disagreed. But you know what? God redeems it. He restores John Mark. We don't know what happens with Demas, but he takes people who fail, thank the Lord, because I'm one of them, and he reestates them. In the sermon notes, which I haven't put together yet, I've... Uh, and it'll probably be up tomorrow. I'm going to link to a, a blog that gives a full treatment to the story of John Mark, uh, Paul, and Barnabas. It's worth the read. Uh, a guy named Sam Storms has compiled all that together, and it's, it's really, really good. I'll link to it in the sermon notes. I'll put them out on, on Monday. But the point is, have you failed? Are you currently in the midst of failing? Have you been failed by someone else? Have you responded harshly to someone else's failure like the Apostle Paul did? Kingdom service still awaits you. Kingdom service still awaits you. Right? Like there's not a uh, three strikes you're out policy in the kingdom of God. The next name we see is Epaphras. He reminds us, this is my favorite one. He reminds us that small town church planting is kingdom work. We're a small town church plant. 
I know people from Barbersville think Barbersville is a big deal, but numerically it's a small town. We get that, right? We're all can be in agreement with that. It might be the best little village in the world, but uh, it's a small town. And this is a church plant in a small town that a lot of people 500 or more miles away from here, maybe even less in some situations, have no idea that it even exists. Small town church planting matters to the kingdom. We meet Epaphras in 12 through 13, even though we already met him earlier on in the book. Epaphras, who is one of you, he's from Colossae, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayer that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Now, Epaphras met Paul in Ephesus. Paul was living in Ephesus. Epaphras met him there, was converted to faith in the gospel. And then, eventually, after being discipled by the Apostle Paul, he makes his way back to his hometown of Colossae and begins sharing the gospel there. And Jesus builds a church. And then he doesn't stop there. He goes to another little town just up the river, Laodicea, Hierapolis, another little town just up the river, and he does it again sees these small town church plants planted in this River Valley community, right? It's, I love Colossae. It's very similar to where we're at geographically in the sense of like what it would look like, what it would feel like. He plants churches in these small towns. And he struggles. The Greek word means actually like a fight for his life. Like, like this was the great fight of his life was to see churches planted In small towns. (laughs) Work that required great exertion. And Paul says that prayer was his lead foot. Like that's what he led with was prayer. His heart was burdened for Colossae and Hierapolis and Laodicea. And so he prayed and prayed and prayed in Christ. And and God is doing a work through him. And and here's the the best time for me to repeat what I've said before to y'all. I'm not the only church planter in this room today. I hope you know that. Y'all are church planters too. Um, You guys know who you are in this room. Whether it's buying a vacuum for the church or giving 25 bucks or Showing up to make coffee. Encouraging others who are struggling and the striving of church planting. You all have helped plant this church. Um, and I could list like a million things. Some of them would make us laugh because they seem kind of funny. Like just little things that have been done. Some of them would think like massive. I told you some of the checks that people have written to this church, right? You'd be like, what? Right? Like, or whatever. Or the deep sacrifice. If I told you how many hours the people who transform this space into a gathering space put in during the month leading up to us having our first gathering in this space. And I could go on. And we'd all be like, this sermon's way too long, so I'm not going to do it. But I mean, there's so many stories. Y'all are the church planters. You are small town church planters, just like Epaphras. And you're worthy of honor, just like Epaphras. And I'm honoring you now. Please receive it. Your Epaphras is in the kingdom God, might this be the fight of our lives while we're here? Not all of us will be here forever, but while we're here, while we're a part of this church plant, might this be the fight of our lives, right? It looks different for each of us, but I mean by that we see the importance of it. The marriages that are being healed because this church plant exists. The people who have been saved because this church plant exists. The people who have fought through suicidal ideations because this church plan exists. I I could go on. 
because this church plan exists. It's a worthy investment of your time. It's a worthy investment of your energy. We're all at different seasons. Nobody's keeping score about who's investing more, but invest in it. You already have. And it strikes my soul so poignantly as I read of Epaphras. Luke is verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. I love this part because Luke reminds us that our jobs, skills, talents, our kingdom work. Paul cites him. In fact, a lot of scholars speculate that Luke would have been the personal physician to Paul throughout his ministry. They travel a lot together. Um, on some of their missionary journeys, and Luke is now there with him in Rome. Maybe he's the personal physician to Paul during this season, making sure he stays healthy. Regardless, he's somehow leveraging the reality of being a physician for the good of the kingdom because Paul feels the need to mention it, and, and, and God saw the need to preserve it. You know Luke's going to write two books in your Bible? The Gospel of Luke and its sequel, the book of Acts. But he's remembered here as a physician. Your career, your skills, your talents, your past experiences put you in a place that God intends for you to be. The skills and talents that you have, the experiences you have, are able to be leveraged for the sake of the kingdom. Don't think of your 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, as second class to whatever happens here in this building on Sunday. It's not. It's kingdom work. The work of the kingdom anywhere Christians go. So it's valuable. It means something. You have jobs. You have talents. Leverage them for the kingdom. Nympha. I mean, that's, you know, talk about losing the lottery on a name. But uh, she is in verse 15. I felt safe with that joke because I didn't think anybody that you know or that's in this place would have that name. It's always a risk when you make fun of a biblical name. So if you do, I apologize, it was just a joke. But we find her in verse 15. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. We don't know who those brothers are specifically. And to Nympha and the church in her house. Nympha reminds us that women are essential to the kingdom. Not not inferior. And, And for some of you, thank God... You just say, well, duh, I know that. And that's good. That means you've not had a bad church experience. Praise the Lord for that. Others of you maybe know why it's important that that be said, because maybe you've had past church experiences or, or you've been around certain ministries where, where women can be considered or treated like second-class citizens. That's not the case. You look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then you just could start. This is just the New Testament. You could... Start there and and just work your way through name after name after name after name. Showing up in pivotal moments, pivotal roles, at the center of some stories with the gospel being proclaimed. So just know that. We see her listed here. That that wasn't required. In fact, it would have been a little bit weird in, in that society, especially Jewish culture, to be honoring women so prolifically like the New Testament does. But... Their place in the kingdom is, is worthy of, of honor. Women aren't at the fringes. I have a, a hope for Mercy Village Church that we would see each other as the Bible tells us, brothers and sisters. That we serve side by side for the sake of the gospel. That that would be true here. That we model that and live that out. Verse 16 doesn't have a name in it. It just says, when this letter has been read among you... The letter to the saints at Colossae, have it also read at the church of the Laodiceans. It'll be a traveling letter. They're going to send it down the road to Laodicea to be read there. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea, which is lost. Nobody has it. We don't know where it's at. God saw fit for us to never read the letter to Laodicea. But it did on that day. And God in His sovereignty and in His goodness, as the Scriptures were preserved throughout history, saw fit that that one wasn't. But there was another letter. That would be shared among the saints. Then he says in verse 17, Say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Archippus reminds us that kingdom work is done by folks who need encouragement. Archippus is a fellow soldier cited in the book of Philemon, the letter to to Philemon. Um, Almost certainly this is Philemon's son. 
Uh, again, Philemon is the, the, the church of Colossae meets in Philemon's house. Uh, Philemon's not mentioned in this list. He has his own letter. So I guess Paul was like, I guess I don't need to talk about him. He gets his own letter. But Archippus is a leader in the church. And we don't know why he needs encouragement. Maybe he's weary. Maybe he's tempted, right? Like maybe there's something, some type of sin or some type of struggle that's maybe pulling him away from the faith. Or maybe he's just tired, worn down, exhausted. But Paul knows that he needs encouragement. He needs exhortation. Maybe he's pressured. Maybe he's doubtful. Maybe he's burned out. But Paul knows he needs encouraged. There's a story of a pastor that I know. He had prepared this event for the church, a good-sized church, and uh, he shows up. He, you know, put hours into the preparation for the event. It was in the week, and and he shows up, and the room is empty, and nobody ever comes. And he's sitting there by himself, and he texts a picture to his wife of the empty room, and just says, "It's empty." And his wife texted him back and said, He's there. Capital H. He's there. I say that because that reminds me of how many times people in this room have sent a text message to me or written a card to me or gave me a phone call or said something to me in passing and not just me, but to each other in this room. And you have no idea how desperately it was needed for that other person. And that encouragement has struck at the right time. So do you need encouraged? Welcome to the kingdom. We all do. That's the the work of the kingdom. We are encouraging one one another. Are you someone who encourages others? Don't forget, leverage that for others, encouraging others. And then lastly, Paul, verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains, he says. Grace be with you. Paul reminds us that suffering serves the kingdom. He says, remember my chains. There's two reasons that I think he might have said that. There's way more reasons he might have said it. There's two in particular I'd highlight. One is, he says, I've talked a whole lot about how Jesus is worthy of everything. Don't forget, I say that with chains around my ankles and chains around my arms in prison. And don't forget that I could have denied this whole thing and walked away and been a free man right now. I'm here because it's worthy. I'm here because it's true. So as you read this letter, don't forget my chains. They testify to the truth and the beauty and the worthiness of Jesus. But I don't think that's the only reason. I think he knows that they're going to suffer too. So he says, remember my chains. When you suffer, remember the chains of Paul, the apostle. Remember the suffering of Jesus. Remember the martyrdom of Thomas. Remember, remember, remember the suffering of the saints as you yourself suffer. Jesus is worthy. So back to the top. Where we started, I get by with a little help from my friends. These are Paul's friends. He loved them. He'd struggled with them. He'd fought with them. He'd He'd been abandoned by some of them. He'd been through the roller coaster that happens in relationships and he has loved them through it all and he he loves them now and he honors them now. These are Paul's friends. And I would ask, are we surrounding ourselves with people like Paul surrounded himself with who, who love the gospel, who choose service over superiority, who take risk for the kingdom? who welcome people from the margins, who are apprenticing with Jesus through their own sins, through their own failures. More importantly, are you embracing the reality that Jesus is your friend? Don't forget that. John chapter 15. This is beautiful if you're willing to hear it today. Starting in verse 13, he says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Hear what Jesus says to his disciples. That goes down to you today. 
Really tune in, please. You are my friends. Jesus, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Paul had friends, but his best friend was Jesus. It would be my hope that all of us would, would value intimate friendship and relationship with Jesus more than any other relationship on this, this planet. The power of Paul's friendships was rooted in that. Live in that reality. Have you ever done something really hard, but you did it with a really good friend? And it takes the ex- maybe the exact amount of time that it would have took to do it by yourself or with someone who's not your friend, but it somehow feels like it took half the time because you're doing it with a good friend. Life is hard. Life is a struggle. It gets long. It gets difficult. It feels barren. What a friend we have in Jesus. Like, I don't even know how to take that and put it in your heart. I don't. That you would just want to bask in the reality that Jesus is your friend. Might that be true? If you're not a Christian, you can be a friend of Jesus today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be saved. Simple. Faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross on behalf of you. You can be saved. Here's what I would call us to as we close in this way too hot church building. One, take regular inventory. Ask, what is my place in contribution to the kingdom? Paul's acknowledging all of his friends and their place in the kingdom. So be regularly inventorying your life. That's a helpful thing to do for the sake of the kingdom. Your time, you have more of that in certain seasons than others. That's a fact. Your talents, sometimes you have the energy to leverage your skills and gifts and talents, sometimes you have less. Your treasures, sometimes you have more resources, sometimes you have less. I'm not inventorying them, that's not my job. But you, before God, inventory your time, your talents, your treasures. What is my role in the kingdom? Be always asking yourself that. There is no greater work that you can participate in than that. So, Then secondly, honor those who work in the, do the work of the kingdom. Here's one like really practical homework assignment you could do if you have kids that are in that kids ministry is when you go to pick them up, get, get this, you can look them straight in the eyeballs, the volunteer in the kids ministry and say these two words, thank you. Just tell them that. Honor those who do the work of the kingdom. You could pick up the phone this week and call the first person to ever kind of, if they're still living, to share the truths about Jesus with you. And you can tell them, thank you for that. That mentor, that discipler that that spoke into your life. There's a list of ministry team leaders uh, back on that sh- those shelves right next to the world map back there. A white strip of paper. You can... Write a note maybe to one of those leaders and hand it to them, encouraging them. Honor those who do the work of the kingdom. And then lastly, we already talked about it. Surround yourself with friends who live thy kingdom come. Okay. Colossians is done. But the number one thing that you must take away from Colossians is this. This is a hard question. Is Jesus the king of your life? Every part of it is Jesus the king of your life. That's the primary message of Colossians. And might I say this, because maybe you hear that and you see this picture of Jesus ready to pounce on you, his minions who aren't doing the right thing. And instead, what I would wish for you to see is that the one who sits on the throne just said, we just saw it just a few minutes ago, says, you are my father friend. You're friends with the king. You are friends with the king. And your friendship with the king is bought by the blood of Jesus. 
Anybody in here got an eraser strong enough to erase the blood of Jesus? No. So what's going to diminish your friendship with Jesus? Like in the sense of like make it zero. Nothing. You're his friend. Live and the king is your friend. And so be with Jesus. Read this book. And as you read this book, receive it as if it's from your friend. The discipline of prayer. When you talk to God, talk to him knowing that he is your friend. And if you don't feel that, then that can be the one thing you pray about. Maybe you don't even open your Bible Monday morning. You just sit there and say one prayer. God, I I haven't felt your presence in seven months. I want to feel that you're my friend. And you just sit there and listen. Maybe you got to do that for the next three weeks. Every morning for five minutes. Just listen. Then you'll come to trust the king. Then you'll submit your life to the king because he's good and he's your friend and he loves you. And he's a good shepherd who's leading you to still waters and and he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death to places of lushness and, and thirst quenching goodness. And he's your friend. That's the way of the kingdom. And that's the only true celebrity in church history. The triune God. The rest of the story is one of countless diverse people, you and me included, transformed and equipped by Jesus for all the seen and unseen work of the kingdom. Father, thank you today that you are here in this place saying over your people, you are my beloved. Jesus, thank you that you are here in this place with your people today saying you are my friends. And Holy Spirit, you want your people to believe that. So in this moment, right now, move up and down these rows and and, and remind your people, convict your people of that reality. That God the Father says, you are my beloved. God the Son says, you are my friend. And in that place of, of being loved, might we submit our whole lives to you. And in that, be like the people listed in this letter who are living thy kingdom come lifestyles for the sake of the kingdom alongside other thy kingdom come people living for the sake of the kingdom. And in that, might our lives be transformed and Mercy Village be transformed and the village of Barbersville and and points surrounding be transformed by people who are being loved by you and submitting our lives to you. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.